Hello. So, we are going to talk about all of the books that I read in June. I had a pretty good but extremely random reading month in June. I kind of have been feeling a little bit reading slumpy, and so I kind of just let myself go and read whatever I wanted. So, there are quite a few thrillers, so we will start with those. The first thriller that I read that kind of got me back into my groove with listening to audiobooks, especially thrillers, was All the Sinners Bleed by S.A. Cosby. I love S.A. Cosby. He is probably one of my favorite authors right now. Like, you know, he writes in a very specific genre. Um, Razorblade Tears was one of my favorite books of last year, and he only has four out, I believe. So I'm kind of torn between like savoring his books or just reading them all right now. So All the Sinners Bleed is pretty much brand new, I believe. We are following the sheriff of a county in Virginia, I think, if I'm remembering correctly. He is the first black sheriff of this county, and so he has kind of experienced a lot of um, controversy from both, you know, kind of uh, demographics of the county. Obviously, there are a lot of um, racist white people in the area who did not want him to become sheriff at all. And then he also has, you know, the black community who doesn't necessarily trust that he is going to be anything other than, a, you know, an, an extension of the state, you know, understandably. So this conflict, you know, becomes really, really relevant when um, two of his deputies shoot a black man who uh, seems to have been involved in a school shooting. And so they are uncovering truths about their uh, community that um, really nobody wants to think about. This was a very dark, very, very dark book. Um, you know, Razorblade Tears was extremely violent, and this one is as well, but... Uh, it also has additionally just darker subject matter, so if you do have content warnings that you like to avoid, I would check out the ones for this book, but really, really great. Then I listened to The Silent Patient um, by Alex McKellides, I think, and this was okay. Uh, this is kind of one of those books that I felt like I had to just read because everybody has read this, and you're essentially following the story of this therapist for this woman who was accused or, like, you know, sentenced to time in this, uh, you know, mental facility for killing her husband um, and she has not spoken since the since they discovered her with her husband's you know body so you know you're trying to figure out did she actually do it is there more to the story why isn't she talking you know all these things and really we just spent so much time talking about the therapist as a character and he was not that interesting to me and yeah, it was okay. I thought that the ending, you know, worked, you know, I could see it being a big twist for a lot of people. But now, you know, when we're like several decades in, I feel like to uh, twist and turn the thrillers, it just wasn't groundbreaking to me. I don't know that I felt like the buildup was really worth it necessarily for me, but yeah. Then I read The Chain which is a, again, quite a dark thriller. This is basically like a dark t twist on uh, chain letters. Like they base, so, oh my God, I'm struggling to explain this, but this girl is kidnapped and they call her mother and tell her that she is now part of the chain. My cat always has to, you know, crawl in here and that she has to kidnap a child and hold it hostage um, in order to get her child off of the chain. So, you know, it's a you know, chain of people kidnapping children and holding them hostage, and then once the next ransom is paid, they can let the child go and, you know, so on and so forth. So you're hearing the story of, you know, that happening and then kind of them trying to figure out what the chain is, dismantle the chain, that sort of thing. So 
I thought that this was really, really creative, really interesting, and I also liked that it was sort of more, I guess you could say realistic than certain other things, like they don't sugarcoat how traumatic this would be for someone, I think. Like, I think a lot of times thrillers will kind of act like you could just get almost murdered and, like, just be like, okay, but it's fine now, you know, like, I'm back home and, like, everything's fine. Sometimes I have nightmares, you know, like, and this kind of dove into that and the characters had really real flaws and um, life struggles outside of this so yeah I thought it was interesting the main character is a like philosophy professor and so she sometimes like talked about philosophers and like tr pat sayings from philosophy and stuff which didn't work super well for me but it was not enough that it really bothered me or anything either it was just like you know you'd be having some narration and then she would say something about like Descartes or whatever and it's like really but okay then I listened to another extremely viral book which is A Good Girl's Guide to Murder this is a YA thriller and so we are following a like senior in high school who has decided to take on a local um, missing person slash assumed murder case for her, like, senior project, and she's not really allowed to do this for her project, but she, you know, thinks that if she does it successfully, they'll, like, accept it anyway, which is very odd to me, but, um, yeah. This was entertaining. It was really, it was a pretty good story. Um, something that seemed extremely strange to me was that, in my opinion, this was very obviously inspired by Serial, the podcast, like, very obviously inspired by it, and there didn't seem to be any credit given or anything like that, and that just kind of seemed weird to me, and I'm not sure if, you know, most of the people reading this maybe weren't around when Serial came out, you know, weren't like aware of true crime podcasts, so they aren't aware of how similar these cases are. Obviously, like, Serial is not a fiction, so there's no ending to it. It's still going on, but yeah, it just, it did feel weird to me because there are striking similarities to the setup of the case and obviously the fact that she's doing this project, it's essentially turning into like a podcast kind of situation. The story is told through um, interviews, through her notes, through, you know, some narrative around what's happening. So yeah, I don't know. Anyway, I did enjoy this and I will be uh, continuing this series. I have the next one on hold from the library. So then I have two kind of thriller-ish books. The first one is a literary book called The Tunnel, and I did listen to this one in Spanish. It is a novella that is like four hours long maybe, and it has been translated into English, and this is such a disturbing book. So we are following a man who is a very, very famous artist who uh, meets this woman who is like looking at one of his paintings that was very very poorly received at an exhibition and he becomes totally obsessed with her and uh, stalks her and does end up being in something you know a relationship with her and then murders her and that's not a spoiler it's in the premise of the book he's telling you his story from prison. And <laughs> this was chilling to read, um, in my opinion. Uh, apparently, it does strongly resemble like Sartre, Sartre, I can't say that, or Camus. Um, I haven't read those. Very direct but like saying terrible things so like he's walking you through the story just directly telling you his behaviors his feelings how he's perceiving these situations that is leading him into doing evil things 
And so just like reading from that perspective was very, very unnerving to me. It was like everyone's worst nightmare, I think. <laughs> so yeah, uh, if you like Camus and Joe Goldberg, then definitely read The Tunnel. And the other one that is not necessarily a thriller, I thought it was going to be a thriller, but it's not really. It's more of just like a literary... I don't know, uh, is Portrait of a Thief. I did enjoy this book. I did not love it, but I really liked it. I think that it is worth the read. So it is set up, like it is purports to be the story of like an art heist. So I think that was part of why I didn't really love it as much as I thought I would because it's really not, it's really not about that. So if you go in expecting like a heist novel, that's not really what this is. It is about trying to steal back art from, you know, museums that have no business having the art in their collections, but mostly it's about this cast of characters who are trying to carry out this, um, you know, theft and how their different lives in the diaspora have uh, have taken place. Uh, the different levels of financial privilege, uh, educational privilege that they have, the different kind of upbringings and different relationships that they all have to China because they are all Chinese Americans. And so some of them have, you know, consider themselves to be, you know, fully Chinese and fully American or maybe relate more to China or more to America. And uh, yeah, I just, it was very, very interesting the character work was super interesting um, and obviously the discussions of colonialism and that sort of thing. Yeah, there were aspects of it that didn't work 100% for me, but I do still think it is well worth the read and I hope to read more from the author in the future. On to literary. I read Song of Solomon by Toni Morrison. I do have a reading vlog in which I read this. It was picked by a random number generator from my TBR, so I absolutely loved this. This is actually the first full-length Toni Morrison novel that I have read, and it was great. So we are following a young man named Milkman Dead, and so you're kind of uh, initially seeing the context in which he was born and then following him through childhood up into adulthood into his like 40s I think and so you're seeing his family context all of his you know relationships with his parents his siblings his um, extended family, his friends, and the people around him. His father is uh, very money-oriented, uh, driven by financial success, kind of expects him to be something that he doesn't necessarily want to be so much of, you know, continuing that family uh, status. Uh, his mother also has a very odd relationship with him, and yeah, it was so, so immersive, so intense as far as, like, the writing style, and, um, it starts out very, very slow paced, but does pick up quite a bit and goes into some kind of surreal adventures, and yeah, I cannot wait to read more of her works, and I do highly recommend this one. I read Las Malas by Camila Sosa Villada. This is an Argentinian author, and she is um, what is referred to in Argentina and I think other places in South America as a travesti, which is a trans identity that kind of evolved uh, specifically in South America, there's a very, very specific culture that goes along with it. And it was so, so interesting to read this and learn more about that. This has been translated into English and it is called Bad Girls in English. So we are following, I believe, kind of a fictionalized account of the author's life. So she grows up, I believe, in kind of a more rural area, but ends up moving to Cordoba for university and ends up working as a prostitute for a while while she is in university in order to get by. And this is primarily following the circle of 
uh, prostitutes that she works with and kind of finds community with. It is funny, it is heartbreaking, it is just so... <laughs> It was such an emotional experience reading this in both a positive and a, you know, not negative way, but in a, you know, negative emotions way. So it says on the back, like, um, a guided visit through the imagination of the author and a distinct chronicle, a distinctive chronicle of, of it all. In the DNA converge the two uh, facets of transness that most repel and terrorize, you know, the the good society, the um, travesti rage, and the fiesta of being travesti. And it just, that is just such a perfect description of it. It's uh, ridiculous, hilarious, beautiful in some portions, very, you know, crude in other portions, and, you know, talks so much about identity about how other people perceive and then correspondingly treat you and yeah just incredible i do highly highly recommend it it is not a long read but well worth it i did read this for a language challenge or project so i do have a vlog on my language learning channel related to this where i you know, talk about it to some extent, obviously. Another literary read was of Cattle and Men, and this was such a good little read. If you are someone who has been sort of interested in the topics surrounding Tender as the Flesh, but do not think that you could read a book about humans being <laughs> factory farmed, I think this is a good alternative. Not that it is like you know, living in the shadow of tender as the flesh or anything like that, but it's a very comparable subject matter, similar, you know, setup, and is also, you know, kind of a short novel, although I think of Cattle and Men is significantly shorter. So the main character, um, Hector, I believe, is the stunner at the slaughtery, at the slaughtery? <laughs> at the slaughterhouse. So he stuns the cattle, um, before they are cut up. And he has a great deal of, I don't want to say pride in what he does, but he has a great deal of conscientiousness. He has a great conscientiousness. He wants his work to be done properly because he does not want this, the cattle to, you know, suffer. Obviously, they are still suffering, but, and his perspective is so telling of the ways that this kind of system is not just exploitative of animals, it is also exploitative of people. The way is that um, a society that functions this way, a society that tolerates this or demands this, is so fundamentally broken, and we just ignore that. And yeah, this was a beautiful book. It is difficult to read, but it is also less difficult to read than some similar books, I think. So again, I do think that this would be a good one to read if you've kind of been wanting to broach the topic, but haven't yet with, uh, you know, Tender as the Flesh or whatever. Yes, I do greatly, greatly recommend it. Couldn't be more different, but uh, moving into the fantasy category, uh, Fourth Wing. So Fourth Wing is a internet phenomenon right now. So this is a new adult fantasy book that has taken the internet by storm. And people have strong opinions about this book. Very strong opinions. And I can totally see why. I do have a reading vlog for this book and I do fall into the group of people that found this book immensely fun to read. So I do also see a lot of the criticism, although I think some people have fallen into criticizing it just for criticism's sake, you know, just to pick things apart. And it's kind of like, once you've gotten to that point with a book, just stop reading it. Like, it's clearly not for you. Um, this is a very, very cringy book in a lot of ways. It is a fantasy with a strong romance plot, and that is something that I normally hate. And in this case, it was, again, super cringy. There were parts where I was laughing out loud rather chaotically 
the, to parts that I don't think you were supposed to be, but wow, it was so stupid. But anyway, um, yeah, so we are following Violet, who has trained her whole life to become a scribe, which is what her father was. And um, then she finds out, basically last minute, again, this part didn't make full sense to me, but she passed the entrance exam to become a rider, a dragon rider, and so her mother, who is a general in the dragon rider army, demands that she, you know, continue with this. But she is disabled, she has what they don't name as... Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which the author has, um, but is basically described as such. And so she's not necessarily in a good place to become a dragon rider. Uh, it is a brutal, brutal regime. <laughs> Training everything, the way that they do everything, has not a single care for human life. So there is a lot of gratuitous death in this book, which I know did bother some people for, you know, very understandable reasons, very reasonable, but I don't know what it says about me, but it, it didn't bother me until I heard people say that afterwards, and then I was like, oh yeah, that maybe should have bothered me, but so she has to, you know, go through this training and try to become a dragon rider, and so yeah, it was ridiculous and fully, fully transported me back to my, you know, 14-year-old self, getting lost in um, absolutely ridiculous, cringy, unrealistic fantasy worlds for weeks and months at a time. And yeah, it was just a grand old time for me. Then I read Stravagantia, which is a new book by Laura Gallego, which is a very, very, very famous Spanish author. Um, I don't think that this has been translated into English, and it probably, I imagine, will not be. But this is a middle grade fantasy that I really, really enjoyed listening to, and I probably will re-listen to it. It is also a little bit cringy. It's very much, like, believes in true love and soulmates and people who are meant to be together. That's not something I believe in, but our main character is kind of obsessed with this boy who will be moving away. And so at his, like, goodbye party, she sees him essentially vanish into this other world. And so she um, kind of accidentally follows him and then is like, oh, no, and doesn't know how to get back. It was very cute. It was a lot less cringy than some of Laura Gallego's earlier books that I have read. So that's good. And it's also short, which some of her earlier books are like 30 to 40 hours long as an audiobook. So this one was only like 10, which is great for me. I did read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe in French. I'm trying to start French. It's going okay. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is a really good language learning book for me because I read it probably dozens of times when I was a kid. Now, I feel pretty medio mediocre about it. It is so religious, and I don't really enjoy that anymore, but I don't dislike the book, so I can still read it for language learning purposes. <laughs> Similarly, I listened to The Bad Beginning, the first uh, that really sounded like I was going to say Bad Bunny. Um the first book in the series of unfortunate events. I listened to it in English in preparation for reading it in French, and it was fine, you know? It it was a series of unfortunate events. I have somewhat fond memories of this series because I used to sneak them out of the library. It was something that I definitely wouldn't have been allowed to read, and so I would put them in a stack of library books and then I wouldn't scan them when I was checking out so that they wouldn't be seen on the uh, receipt or on the, you know, list of books that we had checked out. So I'm very sorry to everyone in the library system that I was in as a child for messing up the count of the <laughs> series of unfortunate events books. <laughs> But I always brought them back, so, you know, this is, you know, quite an iconic series, very strange, like, truly, the um, faith that it must have taken, I feel like, to put out, to publish these books, because I don't think most people would expect that a series truly just about things going wrong 100% of the time would have done so well, but... 
you know, here we are. It was significantly more disturbing reading this as an adult than it was as a kid. Like, the, um, the, the evil count trying to marry the, like, 12-year-old child and, like, I, yeah. But, anyway. Then, uh, last book, um, I read El Mapa de los Anelos. This has also not been translated. It is a Spanish, um, kind of new adult contemporary romancy book. So we are following a girl who is like in her early 20s whose sister has died of cancer and she is kind of trying to not trying to move on with her life but like her sister developed this game called the map of like desires or longings to kind of try to help her get back to her life to find her purpose and everything um, after she has passed away. So it was very sad in some aspects. It wasn't as sad as it could have been. You know, obviously that premise could really play uh, games, but it didn't really, which I appreciated that it didn't, you know, I don't feel like it went overboard in trying to extract an emotional response from you. It was okay. It was quite cringy in some aspects but it didn't bother me that much because it was in Spanish. Um, I would not recommend it. And that was everything. I am going to probably include here some clips of a trip that I took to upstate New York. We were uh, camping and it was very rainy the whole time but we were actually very fortunate to still be able to see everything that we wanted to see. My favorite place that we went was Letchworth State Park and this is kind of apparently, I didn't know this beforehand, but apparently kind of called like the Grand Canyon of the East and it was truly spectacular. I mean I don't think the pictures necessarily fully capture it but the waterfalls were beautiful, incredible. Looking down <laughs> into that can like gorge was quite dizzying. Like I am not afraid of heights other than like a normal level of respect for heights and I would get like a little bit of like vertigo looking down. Very, very spectacular. And I mean, since it's like June and we're just now getting into like good growing season. Everything was so green. Then we did also go to Watkins Glen which is I believe the most famous uh, Finger Lakes Park and this was also beautiful but it was packed. Like we were there on a holiday weekend and it is also just very touristy. So this one, the amount of people there did ruin it just a little bit, but it was also beautiful. We also went to Rochester, New York, and just kind of stopped a few places for uh, a little bit. Uh, we did go to Book Culture um, in a kind of suburb or like an outlying town of Rochester, and I got... Uh, this book, Ten Planets by Yuri Herrera. This is a short story collection by a Mexican author that I have really wanted to get to but haven't yet. And so, you know, I always try to support if I'm in an independent bookstore and I see something that is a reasonable thing. You know, I like to sometimes buy short books because then it's less commitment. Yeah, a quick stop at Lake Ontario, which is obviously beautiful. The water was having a little bit of a algae thing but you can't tell from a distance so it looks gorgeous it was a good trip despite being quite soggy i hope that you guys are having a good summer and i will see you in the next video